Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with red, white, and blueberry grilled chicken. That's right, there's no more patriotic way to celebrate Independence Day than by making a red, white, and blue themed recipe. And speaking of forming a more perfect union, that's what we're trying to do here by combining a very spicy chili rub chicken breast with a beautiful blueberry sweet and sour sauce. And yes, I realize that might sound a little crazy, but you know what else sounded really crazy when people first heard about it? The Bill of Rights. And that totally worked out, for the most part. And I really think this will too. So let's go ahead and get started with the white part of the recipe, the chicken breast. And we will be using the abomination that is the boneless, skinless chicken breast, which I generally hate to use. I prefer my chicken meat next to juicy bones and crispy, fatty skin. But you know what? You and your personal trainer seem to like these. So I decided to take one for the team and use this. And what we'll do to help cover up its inherent blandness is coat these with a very spicy, highly seasoned rub. And because we are going to start this with some vegetable oil, we'll call this a wet rub. So like I said, we'll start with a little bit of oil, to which we will add a whole bunch of salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper, followed by three kinds of ground chili pepper. We will use some paprika, some chipotle, which is a very spicy smoked ground dried jalapeno, and of course some cayenne. And yes, I'm going to use a ton because I want these kind of spicy. So I'll give you the amounts on the blog as usual, and it will be up to you to adjust. You are the Wiccan of your chicken. So we will leave the exact spiciness up to you. And then last but not least, a little bit of finely minced garlic. And we'll give that a mix with a whisk. And once that's set, we will transfer our chicken breast into the wet rub. And we'll move those around a little bit to make sure they're completely and thoroughly coated. And that is pretty much going to be it for the red and the white. So we'll go ahead and we'll wrap that up and pop it in the fridge for a few hours. And yes, if you want, you can leave it in longer. Probably overnight's fine. But generally, I would recommend doing this the morning of your cookout. But anyway, I'm going to pop mine in the fridge for about two hours. And while that chicken sits absorbing those spices, we can move on to the blueberry sauce. So what we'll do is dump some white sugar in a saucepan set over medium heat. And believe it or not, we're going to start this sauce by almost caramelizing sugar. So what I want you to do is put that on medium and just stare at it. Don't stir it. Don't answer the door. Don't answer the phone. Just stand there and wait until you see that sugar melting around the edge. See that, how it's kind of getting clear? And eventually what's going to happen is all that sugar is going to melt. And then it's going to start turning golden, which is when we really have to pay attention. And as soon as it gets to this point right here, where it's just about to go past golden, we will turn off the heat and dump in our vinegar, which is going to be kind of exciting and very cool to look at. And that hot sugar is going to momentarily turn into rock candy, but don't worry. It's going to dissolve in a second. And what we'll do at this point is we'll put our heat back on medium high, and we will add in our fresh blueberries. And we'll give that a little stir. And then all we're going to do is wait for this to come up to a simmer at which point we'll lower our heat to medium low and simply simmer this for about, I don't know, four or five minutes until our blueberries kind of soften up and collapse and our mixture starts to thicken. And like all similar sauces, if yours starts to get too thick, add a little splash of water. On the other hand, too thin, let it reduce a little more. That kind of thing is what we call in the business cooking. So please don't be frightened, but you may have to adjust. And like I said, we'll simmer that for four or five minutes or until our blueberries soften up and collapse and the mixture thickens up a bit. And then because this is a savory sauce, we will do a little pinch of salt as well as some freshly ground black pepper and we'll stir that in. And that is gonna be pretty much it for the sauce. And then what we'll do at this point is remove that from the heat and strain it. And of course, straining is always optional, but I do recommend it. The sauce is gonna look and feel a lot better. So as usual, we'll just push that through our strainer with a spatula and what we're going to be left with is a gorgeous, albeit not blue, blueberry sweet and sour sauce. And as I mentioned earlier, you can totally thin this out with a little bit of water, but I do think it should have a little thickness to it, something similar to a barbecue sauce texture, which really is sort of the purpose this sauce is serving. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can serve this sauce warm, but it's totally fine at room temp, which is how I'm going to serve it. And sure, taste for seasoning if you want, but don't forget, this is going to be paired with a smoky, grilled, highly seasoned piece of meat. So keep that in mind. But anyway, our sauce is set, so we will simply set that aside, and we can move on to grilling the chicken. So let's go ahead and pull our breast out of the fridge, and we will give those just a little bit of a pat down on some paper towels to remove any of that excess wet rub. We do want to leave a little bit on there, but we don't want it dripping. And then assuming our grill is ready, which mine is, we can head outside to cook these up. So I'm going to place those down on the grill. And you know I hate to give times for this kind of stuff. If you force me to guess, mine took about four minutes aside. But there's no guarantees. All I can tell you is try to cook them to perfection. And because you're good people, I'm going to give you some tips on how to figure that out on the blog. 
And because the cooking time is relatively quick, you can just leave these down without touching them until you flip them. But you know what a sucker I am for grill marks. So I did give mine a half turn, which as you know is going to create those gorgeous, professional looking grill marks. Check it out. Look how perfect that is. It's borderline annoying. But anyway, I turned those over. I gave the other side about four minutes or so. At which point we'll pull those off and we'll head back inside for final assembly. So we will let our gorgeously grilled chicken breast rest for just a minute while we spoon a little bit of that blueberry sauce on our plate. And I was actually thinking of doing one of those fancy spoon swipe designs. But then I remembered those are kind of silly. So I stopped, placed down my chicken, which as you can see, I cut a few times on the diagonal. And why do we do that instead of just putting the whole breast on? For drama. Oh yeah, that's a proven scientific fact. By cutting and fanning like this, you get a way more dramatic presentation. And then I also added some pesto macaroni salad to the plate for two reasons. Founding father Thomas Jefferson brought macaroni to America. And forget red, white, and blue. Green is and always will be America's favorite color. And then because I got to take some pictures, I put three strategically positioned blueberries. And then I finished with a little bit of a drizzle of the sauce over the top to create what I call the racing stripes. And that red, white, and blueberry grilled chicken is done. So let me go ahead and grab a fork and knife and begin my pursuit of happiness. And that is exactly what I found. As you take that first bite, as my friend Ralph would say, it tastes like burning. But that fire is quickly put out by the sweetness from that sauce until you take the next bite and it all starts over again. So just an absolutely delicious pairing. I cannot help but think if somehow the founding fathers magically appeared in my kitchen that they would see this and say, that looks incredible. And also, who are you and how did we get here? So on behalf of Tom, Ben, John, and the rest of the boys, I'd like to say we really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Firecracker shrimp roll with crab aioli. That's right, what better sandwich to serve near or on the 4th of July than this explosively seasoned fried shrimp sandwich? And while this still would have been totally amazing without the crab aioli, with it, it was, as the kids would say, fire. Do the kids still say that? I mean, probably not if I'm using it. But anyway, the point is, this really was lit. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our first component, which will be the aforementioned crab-infused aioli. And for this, we will start with about a cup of mayonnaise, to which we will add an equal amount of picked lump crab. Okay, make no mistake, this is not a mayonnaise flavored with crab. This is more like crab flavored with mayonnaise. And then to this, we will add a whole bunch of finely crushed garlic, as well as some salt, a few shakes of cayenne, a few drops of Worcestershire sauce, and just a little kiss of freshly squeezed lemon juice. All right, just a touch. If you add too much lemon to crab, it will mask the sweetness. Which, by the way, is the opposite of our last ingredient, which is some freshly chopped tarragon, which actually enhances the sweetness of the crab. Which is why it's such a common herb for shellfish. So we'll toss in some of that and give this a mix. And that's it. What we're calling crab aioli is done. And we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge until needed. And move on to prepping our shrimp, if even necessary. All right, these days you can often find peeled and deveined shrimp ready to use, which is sort of what I have here. All right, these are deveined and partially peeled, but they still have the tails attached, which I went ahead and removed using the old pinch and pull. And by the way, this is one pound of shrimp, which is going to make two very, very generous portions. But anyway, we'll go ahead and prep our shrimp, and we can pop that in the fridge while we make the buttermilk mixture we're going to dip it into, which besides the buttermilk, is going to include some Louisiana hot sauce, as well as some ground chipotle pepper, and a lot of cayenne. I said a lot of cayenne. There we go. And then we will finish this off with some freshly ground black pepper, and of course some salt. And that's it, we will give this a whisk. And that's going to take care of the wet stuff, which means we can move on to the dry stuff. And what we'll be dredging our shrimp in is a combination of three parts flour to one part cornmeal, along with, if you want, some optional paprika, which will add a little bit of sweetness, but it's mostly there for the color. Okay, once fried, it's going to give our coating a nice shrimpy hue. And then we'll go ahead and finish this off with some salt, and we'll give everything a nice stir. And hopefully most of it stays in the dish. But anyway, we will give that a thorough mixing. And once our breading is set, we can move on to the bread. 
And for this, we're going to want to use a nice soft sandwich roll. Okay, we don't want anything too heavy and dense here. And what we'll do is go ahead and slice in. But not all the way, of course. Okay, just enough to open it up. And then I highly recommend we remove a little bit of the bread from the top, which is not only going to give us extra room for our crab aioli, but it's also, of course, going to make this low carb. And then besides that, what I also think we should do is pop this in a 400 degree oven for about seven to 10 minutes, just to give it a little toasting, which is exactly what I did. And what we'll do is let that cool down for a couple minutes while we move on to transfer our shrimp into our buttermilk mixture. And I'm just gonna do one giant portion here. And what we wanna do after we transfer those in is let those shrimp soak for about five minutes. All right, a little longer is fine, but I don't think we wanna go too long because buttermilk is fairly acidic and we don't wanna end up with accidental ceviche. So we'll just let that sit for about five minutes. And while we're waiting, we should dress our roll because our shrimp are gonna fry so quickly. Once they're done, we wanna build our sandwich immediately. So we'll go ahead and spread both sides of our roll very, very, very generously with our crab aioli. And I do mean generously. Okay, put on what you think is too much and then add one more spoon. And then besides that, we will also put on some shredded lettuce, which in my case is gonna be some hearts of romaine. And that's it, once our roll is dressed and our shrimp have been soaking for about five minutes, we can go ahead and fish those out and transfer them into our breading. And as usual, we'll let most of this stuff drip off. But don't worry, there's still going to be plenty attached to stick to our breading. And we'll definitely want to toss these around so every nook and cranny is coated. And we'll also make a half-hearted attempt to shake off most of the excess. And that's it, once our shrimp are breaded, those are now ready to fry in some hot vegetable oil over medium-high heat. And don't go anywhere once you place these in, because these are going to cook very quickly. All right, they're only going to need a couple minutes per side. And yes, of course, if you have a deep fryer, you could use that if you want. I mean, you are for all the John Mitzowich of this crispy fried shrimp sandwich. But having said that, they really do come out beautifully using this pan frying method. And the great thing about cooking pan fried shrimp is that by the time the outside is golden brown and crispy, the inside is going to be perfectly cooked. So I ended up giving mine a couple minutes per side. At which point we will pull those out to a paper towel line plate and then immediately transfer those onto our dress roll. And as I'm piling these up, you might be thinking, Chef Don, that looks like way too many shrimp. I mean, you're not even going to be able to close that. How the heck am I supposed to eat this? Well, hang on a second. I'll show you. First, I need to finish this with a dusting of cayenne. Because firecracker. So we will give that one last shot of heat. And that's it. It is now finally ready to eat. But not as a sandwich right away. All right, like any great po' boy. We're gonna need to eat some of the main ingredient first before we try to close it, which I will do right now while giving you the very important tip to eat this right away while it's hot. Okay, do not under any circumstances make this sandwich and then take pictures of it for like 20 minutes before you eat it. All right, because as the shrimp sits and cools, that coating's gonna become less crispy. I mean, still amazing, but slightly less crispy. So as usual, yours is probably gonna be better than mine, which really is saying something because this was unbelievably good. All right, this is just a masterclass in perfectly contrasting taste and temperatures with that cold, creamy, garlicky crab mayonnaise playing off our hot, crunchy, sweet shrimp. And not just hot temperature-wise, of course, but we also have all that fiery heat from our spices. So if you'll please pardon the cliche, this really is exploding with flavor. So I really do love everything about this, including its very seasonably appropriate name. And I'm hoping you like this fused to flavor town too. Which by the way is a semi-vague reference indicating where I got the idea for this. But anyway, the point is I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. The great American Burger Dog. That's where I get ready to have your burger world turned upside down. Well, actually, not really upside down, more like elongated. And if you saw the recent U.S. Open from the Olympic Club in San Francisco, you probably saw this cheeseburger. It's very famous. You can only get it there, which means nobody can get it. But I'm going to show you how to make your own. And this is way more than simply a different shaped hamburger. So here we go. So the first thing you're going to need is an extra long hot dog bun. Those regular little short ones are not going to do. I think this one's going about seven and a half, which is perfect. 
And I do want you to measure it because we're going to make our burgers like an inch larger because of shrinkage. And by the way, guys, please measure accurately. Do not embellish. So if this is seven and a half, we want our burger dog about eight, eight and a half inches long. Okay, next we're going to shape the burger dogs, which is easy because we're using plastic wrap. Just put some down. We're going to place eight ounces of burger meat down on that. I'm using a nice 80% grind, 80% meat, 20% fat. All right, we're going to pat it down into a rectangular shape about a half inch thick by about, like I said, eight, eight and a half inches long. And let's just do a quick verification with the old rusty tape measure. Yep, looking good. All right, at that point, we're going to season this. So I'm going to hit that with some freshly ground black pepper and some kosher salt. And the reason we're seasoning that surface is because what we're going to do is we're going to fold this in half and we're going to have that beef seasoned from the inside out. So we're going to fold that over. I'm going to use the plastic to shape this into basically a long rectangle, sort of mimicking the shape and size of the bun. And like I said, it's going to start off a little longer than the bun, but once it cooks, it's going to be perfect. All right, so you're going to do most of the shaping and the smoothing right in the plastic, and then you can unwrap it. And you can do some final tuning with your fingertips. You really want the edges to be smooth so it doesn't break up on the grill. All right. And you can put that in the fridge just like that, ready to go. Or if you're ready to eat like me, you can season that and head out to the grill. All right. So I'm out back. I'm going to place these on my grates. All right. I want you to put those down across the grates because when we go to turn these, we're going to use a spatula and tongs. And we're basically just going to roll them over. So it's just easier that direction so the spatula doesn't catch on the grates. And of course, we've talked about cooking burgers before. I kind of like to go until it looks like they're cooked about halfway up. You're also going to get those dripping beef juice stalagmites. Or maybe those are stalactites. I always get them mixed up. But anyway, some kind of beef juice formation. And right there, I decided to flip mine over. And I'm going to give you my theory on why this is so delicious when we put it on the bun. But one thing I love about this technique, in addition to the season from the inside out... Is it because of the shape, you really get an amazing crust, all right? Because of the geometry here, you get some really great grill marks that pretty much cover the whole surface. And you just don't do that as easily on a thin, round burger, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and top mine with some Munster cheese. You should probably use cheddar. And I just cook mine to a beautiful medium, about 140 internal temperature. That's how I like my burger these days. I'm not a big rare, medium rare burger guy. So we're going to pull those off. We're going to let them rest three or four minutes while we set up our bun, which has just simply been spread with mayonnaise. If you have time, toast it first. We're going to place down the burger dog, and we're going to give it the only recommended additional condiment, ketchup. That's right. We're going to pop that top on, and that is so American I can barely stand it. A hot dog-shaped hamburger. And if you're thinking, big deal, you put a hamburger on a hot dog bun, so what? You haven't tasted this. It could be that perfect proportion between the meat, the cheese, the bun, the condiments, etc. Or is it because Americans love to eat things in one direction? That could be. So for your 4th of July barbecues or any time this summer. So I really hope you give those a try. Head over to foodwishes.com. There's no ingredients. It's just a technique. But still, head over there anyway. And as always, enjoy. Miso glaze skirt steak. That's right. Miso want to do a bad pun right now. But I'm not going to. Anyway, I'm going to show you a very simple miso glaze that is fantastic on a grilled steak. And also, I'm hoping this video inspires you to start finding and using skirt steak. One of the best cookout meats ever. So here we go. So we're going to start with a scoop of yellow miso. It's basically a fermented soybean paste. Kind of salty. And it's great because it makes everything you use it on more delicious. How? Not sure. But it works. And to that, we're going to add a big splash of vinegar. And oddly enough, we're going to use red wine vinegar, which may seem a little strange, but it totally works. Then we're going to throw in some brown sugar for sweetness, a good dose of cayenne. By the way, you people that tune in just to see the cayenne, you're welcome for that close up. I'm also going to throw in a couple cloves of minced garlic. And then we're going to take a spoon and we're just going to mash that and mix that until it's a smooth sauce like consistency. All right, just like that. All right, we're going to set that aside. The miso glaze is done, and it's on to our skirt steak, which is called a skirt steak because apparently this looks like a skirt. Although, you know what I would have called it? A scarf steak. Because I've tried wearing this as a skirt way too short. It doesn't even come close to covering the tenderloin. So that's what it's going to look like when you unroll it. And by the way, I don't want you trimming any of that white fat off. That is not the tough silver skin kind of fat. That is the delicious keep the meat moist on the grill fat. So don't trim it. 
Of course, it's way too long to grill, so I'm going to take some scissors and cut this in like four pieces. Doesn't really matter the size. It's all the same thickness, basically. And the reason I'm not using a knife here is I don't want to cut through the paper. The nice thing about buying meat at a real butcher is you get that nice wax line butcher paper. I'm going to use that to glaze the meat right onto so I don't have to wash an extra plate. So after we cut that up, we're going to take our miso glaze and we're going to spread that generously on both sides. You don't need to save any to baste the meat later on the grill. This is like a one-time deal. Once it's coated with the glaze, I'm also going to give it some freshly ground black pepper. And you really shouldn't have to add any additional salt here because of the miso. But that's really up to you. Now this isn't really a marinade. I'm not going to wrap this up and put it in the fridge for a few hours. I'm just going to leave it on the paper like that while I build my fire. So this is going to sit there for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, until we're ready to grill. And that's all you need. Can you use this as a marinade and put it in the fridge overnight? I'm not sure. I've never tried. So feel free to experiment and report back. But this is just intended to be a simple pre-grill glaze. All right, so those have been glazed and peppered on both sides. So I'm just going to let those sit on my counter while I build my fire. So now fast forward about 35 minutes later, my grill is ready. I'm going over direct, fairly high heat. I always use a charcoal grill, you know that. And of course, like all damp meat on a grill, you need to put it down and not touch it for three or four minutes so that it seals and you get some nice grill marks and you don't tear up your meat. So I just let that sit there, like I said, about three or four minutes until it starts to release. And once I could see that meat was caramelized on and I could move it, I gave it a little half turn, get some extra grill marks. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip mine over. That was about four minutes, I believe. All right, but it's really hard to give times. Of course, the most accurate way is to go by temperature. And I'm gonna recommend you cook these between medium rare and medium. Rare skirt steak is tough skirt steak, I found. And again, you know some meats I like on the rare side, some meats I like a little more well done. This is one where I think the texture is much more pleasurable, a little closer to medium. And there's one great tip for skirt steak. It looks kind of sweaty when it's done. So you see that the meat has like a little bit of a shine to it? That's the moisture inside being forced to the surface. And that happens right when the meat goes from sort of medium rare to medium, and that's when I like to take it off. Okay, so that one piece was done. The other ones were a little thicker. I'm going to wait another minute. And while I was waiting, I had this brilliant idea. I decided to char some cherry tomatoes over the hot coals to serve alongside my skirt steak. So I threw those on. I just gave them a quick toss while I waited for my other pieces to finish. And you can really see there. See how that meat's getting a shine to it? That is going to be perfect medium. All right, so I'm going to pull that off. I don't want the tomatoes to collapse. I'm just trying to char the outside a little bit. Give it a little warmth and a little smokiness. All right, so those are good. I'm going to get those off. And you know I hate to use the fast motion effect, and here's why. It's kind of annoying. All right, so we're going to head inside. We're going to let that rest at least, at least five minutes. And my favorite thing about skirt steak is while it rests, it makes its own sauce. Check it out. You're going to have this amazing natural jus that comes out. And we're going to use that to spoon over the meat. All right, five minutes later, I'm going to go ahead and slice this. You see it's still pink, but it's not red, it's not raw, it's not rare. And of course you're going to slice against the grain, just like flank steak, just like just about every other meat we slice. And that is ready to taste. And how was it? Incredible. Juicy, flavorful, slightly salty, slightly smoky, slightly sweet. So I'm going to slice that, I'm going to lay it down on a plate, I'm going to spoon over that natural juice, and that is a pretty beautiful plate of food. I went low carb, my grilled tomatoes, some Chinese broccoli, so this really is a great flavorful glaze that produces a very juicy, tender skirt steak. So this piece was like the most cooked of all the pieces. And look at this fork go through it like butter. So cool. So anyway, if you want to raise the hemline on the awesomeness of your next cookout, may I suggest miso glazed skirt steak. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. cherry bomb chicken and i know what you're wondering are those cherries on there no no cherries were harmed in the making of this recipe all right why is it called cherry bomb chicken then well that's because of the brine which is really what this video is about so the bane of the backyard barbecue is of course dry flavorless chicken so we're going to take care of that with a very special brine which starts with water salt and sugar i'm going to put that over low heat just until the sugar and salt melt or dissolve sorry Please, scientists, save your emails. I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to let that cool down to room temperature while I prep my chicken. All right, so I took one large, free-range, of course, chicken. I cut it in quarters. 
All right, it's on the bone. I'm gonna make little, very shallow slashes, two in the breast and two in the thigh, right at the thickest point. Just go through the skin and maybe, maybe an eighth of an inch into the flesh. That's gonna help the brine soak in. I'm gonna place that in a plastic container and then we're gonna finish the brine. Now I know the suspense has been killing you. Here's why it's called cherry bomb. We're gonna use cherry tomatoes as a base for the brine. All right, so that's the cherry part. The bomb part is these habaneros. One would probably be enough. Two, borderline crazy. Three, that's how many we're putting in. And by the way, I'm just kidding. It's not really gonna be that spicy, believe it or not. All right, some garlic, some allspice, and then I'm gonna pour in our room temperature brine. All right, I'm gonna bring that over to the blender. All right, I'm gonna blend that until extremely smooth. I wanna totally puree all that pepper and tomato and garlic and so forth. Once that happens, pour it over the chicken. It should cover. I'm gonna cover that with the lid. I'm gonna put it in the refrigerator and let that brine for four hours. Okay, four to six hours is fine. All right, I'm gonna pull it out. I'm gonna lay it on some paper towels to drain. I'm also gonna pat off all the brine from the top. I want dry chicken when it hits the grill. While that's sort of air drying for a few minutes, I'm gonna make a little bit of an oil rub. Nothing too fancy, some dry thyme, some cumin, some black pepper, of course, a little cayenne. You knew that was coming. And just a little splash of a neutral oil. I'm using grapeseed, canola oil, something like that. Give it a stir and that's it. I'm gonna brush some of that down on the plate so I don't have to flip my chicken. I'll put the flesh side down, that'll touch the oil. And then I'm just gonna paint the rest over the top on the skin side, cause that's gonna be the side that goes down first where I wanna get those really nice grill marks. And that is ready for a very hot grill. So my strategy generally with this kind of stuff is to just do a quick sear on the skin side. I like deep black grill marks. I think it's part of the flavor profile. I want that. Or if you wanna do it all over indirect heat, go ahead. But I like to give it a nice three, four minute sear on that side. Because of the sugar in the brine, you're gonna get beautiful, beautiful grill marks. All right, once that's turned over, then I kind of move them off to the side. See my coals, you can't see it here, but the coals are to the right. So I'm gonna kind of nestle those to the left. So they're not directly over the hottest part of the flame. I'm gonna cover, close my vents about halfway. That'll lower the temperature a little bit. And then I'm gonna roast those basically over those nice smoky coals for about 30, 35 minutes. When they're very close to being done, I'm gonna paint the top with some red pepper jelly. That's right, every big supermarket has some red pepper jelly. But if you go to a farmer's market, you'll find some really cool ones. All right, now once that's cooked to perfection, and I always recommend you cook things to perfection, I'm gonna pull that off on the plate. I'm gonna let it rest in a window, ideally one with filtered sunlight coming through it through a swaying tree. Let it sit there 10 minutes. And this was such a beautiful sight. In my head, I heard this music. And I was thinking, that's nice music, but it could use some more cowbell. Into the final stages of cherry bomb chicken. Rested chicken goes on plate next to pinquito beans with some fresh lime. I cut into that breast and I can't express how amazingly juicy, tender, moist, delicious that chicken meat is. I know we use three habaneros, but it's not too spicy. I believe that tomato in the brine gives it a very subtle tanginess. That brine should have perfectly seasoned the inside, so I'm not gonna add any salt to the surface. I think it's almost impossible not to have amazing, juicy chicken this way. Think about all those poor bastards doing plain grilled chicken breasts this weekend and really crushing the competition, and by competition I mean your neighbors, is what being an American is all about, and that's what we're celebrating this holiday, okay? So give that a try. All the ingredients are on foodwishes.com, of course. And as always, enjoy, and have a great 4th of July. Bacorn. That's right, if you like bacon and you like corn, you are absolutely gonna love this cheesy jalapeno and bacon spike cream corn, which I'm officially presenting as a side dish. But truth be told, I actually ate this all by itself and it really was magnificent. So I think next to like a salad, this would be a great main course also. And by the way, other than the bacon, this is pretty much a vegetarian dish. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by adding a half a pound of bacon to this dry skillet. 
which is over medium high heat. And the first thing we're going to want to do here is cook this, stirring occasionally, until it's almost, but not quite cooked crisp. And as you'll see, most of the fat's going to render out, which we will then use to cook our other ingredients in. And if there's one thing I know about other ingredients, is that cooking them in bacon fat is almost always a great idea. So like I said, we'll go ahead and cook our bacon until almost crisp. And while we're waiting for that to happen, let's go ahead and talk corn. And this is one of those recipes that will work equally well, whether you shave these kernels off fresh corn, or just thaw and drain some frozen corn like I'm doing here. In fact, if it's early in the season, the frozen corn might actually work better, since it'll be a little sweeter. But either way, we're going to need about two pounds. And then what we'll do once our bacon is almost but not quite crisp, is go ahead and add about half of our corn in, which we will then lightly toast in this hot bacon fat. And of course, since I love to give you options, for this step you could add all the corn, or none of the corn. But I like to split the difference, and toast some of it, just to provide a little extra sweetness, and bring out some of those subtle caramely notes. But anyway, you decide. But personally, like I said, I like to do about half, and cook it until those kernels just start to take on a little golden brown color. And then once that happens, we'll go ahead and introduce the rest of our vegetation, including a whole bunch of minced garlic, as well as some sliced green onions, mostly the light and white parts. And we can save those darker green parts to garnish later. And then for some beautiful bittersweet heat, we will toss in a couple diced jalapeno peppers and stir all this together. And then what we should do is cook this for about three or four minutes or until those veggies start to soften and sweeten up. Oh, and you may have noticed, I didn't drain off any of that bacon fat when we cooked the bacon. Okay, I wanted to make sure we had plenty to saute all the rest of the stuff, which we definitely did which means we can probably get rid of some of that fat now if we want. And a great trick for doing that while we're cooking with stuff still in the pan is to just sort of push everything off to one side. And then by simply taking a wadded up paper towel and some tongs, we can tilt the pan, which will have the excess oil running to that end, where it can be quickly and easily absorbed. So feel free to do that at any point during the cooking process. And then the other thing we can do while our veggies are cooking is go ahead and add our seasonings, which will include some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, and of course the obligatory shakes of cayenne. And we'll go ahead and stir all that in, and we'll continue on medium high until we think our veggies have cooked long enough, at which point we'll go ahead and introduce our heavy cream. And by the way, the recipe which inspired this actually uses mayonnaise and sweetened condensed milk instead of cream, which seemed a little overly rich for me, and what's the word I'm looking for? Insane? So it sounds kind of funny to say, but we are actually doing a lighter version by using heavy cream. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that in and wait for it to come to a boil. And then once that happens, we'll go ahead and dump in the rest of our corn. And we'll continue stirring and cooking until we're sure that's all heated through. And then once we're positive that's happened, what we'll do is turn off the heat and stir in a lot of cheese. And I'm going with one part mozzarella to two parts Monterey Jack. Although as usual, please use whatever cheeses you want. I mean, you are after all the Jason Bourne of this cheesy baked corn, but the original recipe just uses mozzarella. So I thought I would semi-honor that with the addition of some Monterey Jack, which is kind of like mozzarella, only has a little more flavor. But regardless of what you use, we'll go ahead and stir that in. And then let me give you a little heads up here. One thing I learned about this recipe is that if you want the cheese all nice and stringy and stretchy, you have to brown the top and serve this immediately. Because if you wait like an hour like I did, you will not experience the same effect as you're about to see. But anyway, whether you wait or do it right away, we're gonna go ahead and finish the top with cheese before browning it. And here you can see me doing this very intricate pattern that I thought would look super cool. But as you're about to see, once it was browned, you could not tell I did this. So yes, this was a complete waste of time. But you know what? I regret nothing. I mean, come on, we gotta try things. Even if they don't end up working. Okay, the attempt is still heroic. So I went ahead and cheesed the top, and then finished up with one last dusting of cayenne. And that's it, once that's set, we'll go ahead and pop that in a very hot oven, or preferably under a broiler, for about five to 10 minutes, or until everything is heated through, and the top is beautifully browned, and hopefully looking a little something like this, which I think looks amazing, and really doesn't need a garnish, but if we have some of those green onion tops around, we might as well slice those up and throw them on. Besides, it's a proven scientific fact that eating raw onions, even a small amount, helps prevent disease. So keep that in mind if you're one of these I don't like onions people. I mean, you should still do it for your family. And that's it.
Our bacon is done and ready to enjoy. Probably as a side dish. But I didn't actually have any other food to serve next to this. So I just went ahead and ate this all by itself. And it really was fantastic. Oh, and like I said, if you let this sit, that cheese loses all its stringiness. And it basically just sort of dissolves into the cream to form one of the best cheesy sauces you've ever had. And of course, all that bacon and jalapeno don't hurt. In fact, I'm going to switch to a spoon so I can get more of that stuff. And every single ingredient in this, from the cheese to the green onions to our peppers and bacon, are just absolutely perfect pairings with sweet corn. I mean, it really does not get much better than this. So basically, this is my new all-time favorite cream corn recipe. Oh, and by the way, if it's still piping hot, the texture's going to be fairly loose. But as this cools, it will thicken up, which will make this even more side dish-like. And this stuff would be perfect served room temperature at a picnic or a barbecue. But anyway, that's it. A little something we call bacon. And by we call, I mean, of course, the bun shop in L.A. calls it that, which is where the original recipe that inspired this is from. But anyway, clever names aside, this is a beautiful, delicious, and easy-to-make corn side dish that's equally amazing hot, warm, or room temp, which is why I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Red, white, and blue cheese balls. That's right, these might not look like it, but you never want to judge a ball by its cover. Because inside, we are pairing fire-roasted red pepper, fresh white sweet corn, and blue cheese. And not only is the inside amazing, but these are also getting rolled in all sorts of extra deliciousness, which really elevates these, and maybe also causes some color-related confusion, but still totally worth it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by me showing you the safest and easiest way to cut fresh corn off the cob. And that involves placing a ramekin or small cup at the bottom of a big bowl. And then by holding our cob at the tip vertically like this, it's gonna be very easy to go around with a sharp knife, slicing off those tender sweet kernels. And this way we don't have to worry about hitting the sides of the bowl with the knife. And more importantly, leaving our fingertips fully intact. And in case you're wondering, one large ear of corn is gonna give you about a cup of kernels, depending on the size, of course. And by the way, if you've never had raw, fresh, sweet corn, you're really in for a treat, since it has this great juicy, crunchy texture. And if it's in season, it should be sweet like candy. And it's going to pair perfectly with that salty, sharp blue cheese, as well as the bitter sweetness from our smoky, fire-roasted red pepper. Which, by the way, is the next thing we're going to prep. And while I usually do this inside on the gas burner, this time I'm going to show you an alternative method using a blowtorch. And what I have here is an extra large variety, that I bought to kill weeds in our rock garden, which by the way, it doesn't work at all for. But what it's really good for, as long as you're on some heat proof surface, like the grate of this fire pit, is charring the skin off a of pepper. And not only is this very fast and efficient, I gotta say it's super fun, especially when you catch your neighbor peeking over the fence to see what the heck you're doing. And yes, it's a total coincidence that Michelle just cleaned the stovetop and she gave me the side eye as I walked over towards the range to do this. But anyway, the point is a giant blowtorch works wonderfully, as would a regular standard blowtorch. It just takes a little bit longer. And then just like if we did this inside on the stove, once that's been thoroughly charred, we'll go ahead and cover that tightly, and we will let that steam and cool down, at which point you know the drill. We will rinse and rub that charred skin off the pepper, and then dice it up, at which point it's ready to use in our cheese balls. Speaking of which, the base for that is going to be a pound of cream cheese, and we really do want to use regular cream cheese, the kind that's firm when it's cold. Okay, that soft whip stuff is not going to work for this procedure. But anyway, to our pounded cream cheese, we will add a little bit of soft butter, which, yes, is going to add a little bit of richness. But also, as you know, butter gets really hard when it's cold, and that's going to make the texture of these cheese balls just a little bit firmer. And then to this base, we will add a little bit of kosher salt. Right, not too much because blue cheese is salty. We will also do some freshly ground black pepper, and yes, you guessed it, a few shakes of cayenne. At which point we can go ahead and add our red, white, and blue in the form of our roasted red pepper that we've diced up nice and small, our beautiful sweet white corn, and then about a quarter pound of crumbled blue cheese that you have most definitely crumbled yourself, which by the way is super easy if you freeze it first. And I know they do sell it already crumbled up, but please trust me when I tell you, they are not crumbling up the best blue cheese. 
So personally, I recommend getting something nice and then pop it into the freezer until it's firm. At which point, like I said, it's very easy to crumble up or even chop up with a knife. But regardless, once everything's in the bowl, we'll go ahead and give that a mix until thoroughly combined, which is going to take a minute or two, since we're going to want to start out kind of slowly. Otherwise, half these ingredients are going to end up on the table. But once it starts to all come together, we can get a little more aggressive, and we can start folding and turning and stirring until we are 100% certain everything's been thoroughly and evenly mixed. And then once that's been accomplished, what I like to do is wrap this and pop it in the fridge for a few hours until it's chilled thoroughly and firms back up, which I think makes it a little easier to portion. But if you're short on time, you can scoop this now if you have to. But anyway, that's up to you. I mean, you guys are after all the Leslie Stahls of your red, white, and blue cheese balls. And speaking of 60 minutes, that's exactly how long I pop mine in the fridge for. And then once that mixture has been chilled, we'll pull it out. And we can start scooping about one tablespoon portions onto this line sheet pan. And obviously, you can make these as big as you want. But fair warning, these are extremely flavorful and fairly decadent. So I think a relatively small portion is the way to go. And then, just like when we mix this up, if we have time, I like to pop these in the fridge until they're nice and cold and firm before we try to roll them. But again, you don't have to. As long as you're able to form them and you chill them before you serve them, they should be fine. But I had time, so I popped mine in the fridge for about an hour and then proceeded to roll those in the three coatings of my choice. The first of which were some very finely chopped roasted almonds. And not only does the coating add texture and obviously flavor, but since this style of cheese ball is relatively soft even when chilled, the coating really is necessary to be able to handle these. And I don't just mean when you form them, I mean when you actually serve them. Okay, we want these to melt in our mouths, not in our hands. So I went ahead and did some of those in the almond, and then switched to my second coating, which would be some beautiful green freshly sliced chives. And of course, any other kind of fresh green herb would work here. Or something like parsley or dill would be very nice. But with these ingredients, I think that subtle oniony flavor of the chive is really fantastic. And that's it, we will close the show with our headliner, which will be some finely minced up crispy cooked bacon. And as usual, we'll want to prep about twice as much bacon as we think we need, because the next person that's able to do this without eating half the bacon will be the first person. So plan accordingly. And that's it, once our coating phase has been completed, we'll go ahead and cover those and pop them in the fridge, since we really do want those fully chilled when we serve them. And while that happens, we can tidy up a little bit. And we can put on our face and wait for our guests to arrive. At which point we can serve these up on some kind of attractive platter. Okay, I recommend mango wood. But if you can't find that, feel free to substitute with papaya. And that's it, our red, white, and blue cheese balls. Which look like red, green, and tan cheese balls are ready to enjoy. And I started with the bacon one. Because that's my favorite. And it is everything you'd imagine it would be. Alright, above and beyond that smoky, savory, meaty coating we have the irresistible combination of that smoky, sweet red bell pepper, that fresh, crunchy, even sweeter white corn, which are both an absolutely perfect pairing with that funky, tangy, sharp blue cheese. Oh yes, that, my friends, is a magnificent bite of food. And if I had a nice cold beer in my other hand, I would be about as happy as I could possibly get. So that was incredible. And then I moved on to try one of the chai versions, which also works wonderfully for all the same reasons. Not to mention chives and cream cheese are always great together. So I thoroughly enjoyed that one as well. And then as sort of a dessert course, I went ahead and finished up with the ones rolled in almond. Since as you probably know, it is very traditional to finish a great meal by serving cheese and nuts. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling red, white, and blue cheese balls. And if that name seems a little too long, these also go by the name freedom balls. Bob, regardless of what you call them, or what you coat them with, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. No bake cheesecake flag cake. That's right. Not only am I gonna show you how to make a no bake cheesecake, a food wish I've been putting off for years, but I'm also gonna show you how to decorate it like a flag for your 4th of July celebration. And if there's anything more American than a no-bake cheesecake made to look like our flag, I don't know what it is. So anyway, let me show you how to make this super simple and ultra patriotic dessert. 
So we're going to start with a graham cracker crust. And this is pretty much identical to the recipe we used for our frozen s'more pie. All right, graham cracker crumbs, butter, and sugar, except this time I'm adding a couple spoons of cocoa to turn it into a chocolate graham cracker crust. And by the way, I didn't measure any of this because I thought I could just eye it, and it ended up coming out a little dry. But the ingredient amounts on the blog will be accurate, so you'll be fine. I just didn't feel like measuring. Do I regret my decision? Absolutely not. One thing we Americans pride ourselves on is lack of regret. In fact, I think I have a t-shirt that says something to that effect. But anyway, you're simply going to mix your crust ingredients together, and then you're going to transfer that into a rectangular shaped casserole dish, and pat it down nice and even, press it down firmly, and as you well know, once we refrigerate that, that's going to firm up beautifully, and that will be the base to our no-bake cheesecake. So we're going to wrap that up, throw it in the fridge for about a half hour while we make our filling. And that's going to start with cream cheese. So in a mixing bowl, I have half regular cream cheese and half mascarpone which is a very rich, incredibly delicious Italian cream cheese. So I'm using both. You could use all one or the other. But regardless, you do want it at room temperature and fairly soft. All right, if this is really cold and hard, it's going to be very tough to mix. So room temperature will work best. And then to that cream cheese, we're going to add some freshly grated lemon zest, a little bit of lemon juice, and then a big splash of real vanilla extract. And please do not use artificially flavored vanilla for this flag cake. That would be a total slap in the face to Betsy Ross. Okay, so use the good stuff. And then we're going to take our spatula and mix that in thoroughly and simply set that aside while we make the rest of the filling, which is nothing more than a whipped cream. So in another mixing bowl, we're going to put in some white sugar and some very cold, heavy cream. The colder it is, the better this works. And we're going to take a whisk and we're going to whisk that up until we have peaks. And it's come to my attention that some of you actually buy whipped cream because you don't know how to make it. And that kind of makes me sad because it's so easy. So stop buying whipped cream. So get in there with your whisk and mix it enthusiastically. And not a lot happens right at the beginning, but just keep mixing and you'll see it thickens up fairly quickly. So when it looks like that, I want you to stop. Don't overmix it. That's perfect. At that point, we're going to dump it into our cream cheese mixture. And once those two components are mixed, your filling is done. So we're going to mix that up. I'm actually going to switch from the spatula to the whisk, which I thought would be a better tool for this. And it was. So mix that up smooth. And then go ahead and take your pan out of the refrigerator and transfer that filling on top of that gorgeous chocolate graham cracker crust. Of course, you're going to distribute that evenly and smooth out the top best you can. And towards the end here, as I was finishing smoothing the top, I was thinking to myself, I should tap that. So we're going to give it the old tappa tappa, settle everything down. And once you've given it the old tappa tappa, go ahead and wrap that in plastic and put it in the fridge for at least three or four hours until it's completely firm because it has to be firm before we decorate, okay? And then once it's perfectly firm, we're gonna pull it out and get our stars and stripes on. And by stars and stripes, of course, I mean strawberries and blueberries. So for my stripes, I'm just using strawberries cut in half. Oh, and quick tip, try not to drop them because you'll have to clean them off. And then here's my method for a perfectly laid out flag. You're gonna wanna do the bottom row first, right against the bottom, nice and straight. Then I want you to go all the way to the top of the cake and go over about two thirds of the way because we wanna leave space for our blue field of stars. And the reason I do the top and the bottom first is because then I can see how much space I have in between. So I was able to determine based on the size of my strawberries that three more stripes would be perfect. If you just started from the bottom and worked up, you might get to the top and have a little too much or too little space. So this way it's gonna be nice and even because once you place them down, you can't really move them. So continue on until all your stripes are done. And I'm sure you figured out what was coming next. We're going to fill in that top left with our blueberries. And I'm placing them so that little dimple is up. I think that looks cooler. I don't know the technical blueberry anatomy term for that. And of course, if you're not from America, you can also do this as long as there's fruit that happen to come in the same colors as your country's flag. Okay? And once those blueberries are in place, your no-bake cheesecake flag cake is done. Check it out. It's so realistic, especially if you're far away and kind of squinting. Looks exactly like an American flag. And as far as service goes, as long as you chilled this thoroughly, it will cut fairly easily. Of course, the first slice is always a challenge, especially if you're like me and couldn't find your square spatula and grab this stupid rounded palette knife for some reason. Even using this horribly awkward tool, it still came out nice and clean. But then I came to my senses and found a square spatula, which worked way better. And there you go. You can see that gorgeous texture, that beautiful crust. And one heads up, if you've never had a no-bake cheesecake before, the texture is nothing like a traditional cheesecake. All right, the flavor profile is very similar, 
but it's way, way, way lighter, much more like a mousse texture. So this is gonna be significantly less dense. Just a very nice, light, sweet treat. And I thought it would make a perfect canvas for our very patriotic 4th of July flag design. So whether you're an American or just love Americans and America, because we are the greatest country in the history of the world, and also one of the nicest and most humble, I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Red, white, and booze. That's right, what better way to celebrate the 4th of July than with these red, white, and blue boozy popsicles. And sure, these are actually red, white, and purple, but hey, this is America. It's what color we say it is. Got it? Good. But anyway, since colors aren't actually flavors, we're also gonna call this a strawberry blueberry cheesecake popsicle. So let's go ahead and get started, and the first step is to make a simple syrup. And despite the name, this is actually very easy to do. So in a little saucepan, we're gonna dump some white sugar and some water, not equal parts. That's a classic simple syrup, but this one has a little more sugar in it. And of course, I'm gonna give you all the exact measurements on Food Wishes. So what we'll do is we'll stir that together over medium heat until that sugar dissolves into the water and the mixture basically turns clear. And it's only gonna take a couple minutes. So don't go anywhere. Just stand there, stir it once in a while until it basically looks like that. At that point, we're simply going to turn off the heat and let that cool down to room temperature while we get started on the next step, which is the first layer, also known as the strawberry layer. So we're going to take some fresh strawberries and trim them up. We're going to cut off the top, of course, and I'm just going to quarter those into a measuring cup. Right there, I saw a little piece of green leaf, which I pulled out, but we can't have that. So we're going to trim up those strawberries, and then I'm going to transfer them into this little mini food processor that I believe I got when I opened a free checking account. But feel free to use a normal size food processor or even a blender. And then besides the main ingredient, each one of these layers is getting the same two additional ingredients, which are the simple syrup we just made and, to make a boozy, some vodka. So we're going to pour in about three quarters of a shot of vodka, along with our now cooled simple syrup. And then we'll go ahead and pop the top on and blend this until smooth. Or at least as smooth as one of these little things is going to get me. So we'll go ahead and blend that smooth. And don't worry about the pink color, that's all the air bubbles. Those are gonna dissipate and this will take on a much deeper color. And once our fresh strawberry puree is done, we're ready to start building these popsicles. And I'm gonna use one of these, your standard plastic popsicle mold. And of course you could just use little paper cups and popsicle sticks, totally will work. So I'm gonna go ahead and distribute my strawberry mixture evenly between those six molds. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna to toss that in the freezer so that layer can freeze before we add the second layer, which is the cheesecake layer. So in a bowl, I have some nice, soft, room temperature cream cheese. And I don't want to give the brand, but I'm using the one from that city whose sports teams aren't that good. And then to that, we're going to add some simple syrup. And we'll mix that up before we add our vodka this time. And you really should add this gradually, so it's easier to mix. But I'm not into that. I dumped it all in. And it does look like hell at the beginning. But just keep mixing and mixing and mixing, and pretty soon, it will look heavenly. And by heavenly, I mean perfectly, perfectly smooth. Just like that. And then we can go ahead and add our vodka to this layer. And when that's incorporated, you should have a nice, pourable cream cheese mixture. And by the way, we're calling these boozy popsicles because there is a little bit of alcohol in them, but not that much. I'd probably describe it as not enough to make you giggle, but enough to make you grin, which is still pretty good. And then once our strawberry layer has firmed up, which is probably going to take you at least an hour, we'll go ahead and top with our white layer, of course dividing it equally between the six molds. And one reason you really want to make sure that strawberry layer is frozen solid is because if you add this room temperature cream cheese mixture on top, it will kind of melt it and make like a pink layer, which as you can see happened a little bit here because I was in a hurry. But no big deal, as long as that strawberry layer is kind of firm, you should have some decent looking layers. And then once our cheesecake layer is done, we're going to do the exact same drill again. We're going to freeze that layer until it's firm and top it with the final layer, which of course is our blue layer, starring blueberries. And just like our strawberry layer, we're going to puree this with some simple syrup and some vodka. And we'll blend that as smooth as our device allows. And just like the strawberries, this is going to appear a lot lighter right now with all these air bubbles blended into it than it will at the end, okay? This is actually going to darken up and thicken up beautifully. And then, like I said, when the cheesecake layer is firm, we're going to pull that out. We're going to top it off with our blueberry mixture. And once we've done that, we're finally ready to put in the sticks. And of course, because I'm using these fancy molds, it comes with this little drip guard. And by the way, people, please do not be sampling the vodka while you're doing this. Check out this last one I'm placing, totally upside down. Had no idea. Completely oblivious. So like I said, don't do too much vodka sampling while you're working on these. Kids, that's called a cautionary tale. But anyway, I did realize my mistake about five minutes later. So I flipped it over. And as they say, all's well that ends well. 
And then all we need to do is let these freeze completely solid. I totally recommend overnight. But that's between you and your patients to decide. And at that point, of course, they're ready to enjoy. And look at those beautiful three layers, which of course represent life, liberty, and the pursuit of lusciousness. And then all we have left to do is take off that protective plastic sheath and start eating. And man, were these delicious. Basically, you're tasting pure fruit. And as far as texture goes, I thought this came out perfectly. It's really not that hard and icy. It's really much more like a strawberry sorbet. And as you're eating this, you have complete freedom of choice. You can eat straight down, eating all three flavors separately, or you can go down the side and bite where the layers intersect and get some strawberry cheesecake and then some blueberry cheesecake. So I find that kind of freedom very empowering. Of course, that could also be the vodka. But anyway, that's it. A fun, delicious, patriotic, popsicle-based tribute to America. I think if the Founding Fathers were alive today, they'd be so proud of this and would agree that all those struggles they went through were totally worth it. Okay, so I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.